Hi, it's John from Dyna Spectrum. In this video, I want to talk about how a DASR ECQ using a DS1 is adjusted to develop the target boost pressure that you want. This is our method of doing it, which we find it works smoothly and is easy to teach and easy to extend from stage one up to stage crazy. This video is for pro tuners or previous tuners that want to adapt to this platform, people that want to go beyond black box tunes and people that want to understand what's going on when they work with a custom tuner better so that they can give them the data that they need. Also just as a general overview for people that are interested. Our plan it would be to follow this up with part two on how we actually deliver the target boost that we're setting in this video and possibly live sessions with Q&A or dyno tests. Tell us what you're interested in and what you need. It's not to make us all into pro tuners overnight. Pro tuners on this platform are very skilled, they've got amazing results and us joining the platform we want to improve their tools and assist them in doing their job better. We also want to provide really good off the shelf tunes and help a small number of people that have previously tuned themselves that want to understand and perhaps tweak a little bit themselves. But overnight you're not going to become a pro tuner that can do everything yourself. So keep that in perspective that there's a lot to learn. It's a very complex ECU. Custom tuners are very valuable and the skills are hard won over many years and they can quickly get you to a point and probably save you money compared with doing it yourself if you don't know what you're doing. The important thing to think about with boost control is that everything is closed loop and that every value possible in the ECU has a target value and an actual value and most of them are always being driven as smoothly and as quick as possible to their target. These, these values can be things like boost, they can be torque, air fuel ratio, lots of things and they can be real values measured from real sensors or they can be virtual or estimated. In fact torque in the ECU is virtual and estimated based on things like load and boost and ignition timing. A lot of the nature of a torque controlled ECU like this is to give safety with drive-by wire throttles after some of the complaints in previous decades with Toyotas and Audi 5000 and so on where vehicles would be claimed to accelerate in an unintended fashion and with an automatic gearbox and no ignition key if you don't know how to shut the engine down there's concern that it could run away with you so there's a lot of safety mechanisms in these ECUs based around that there's a lot of checks and nannies some of these need to be moved when tuning but they need to be moved with care so that you don't delete important safety features but there are many limits that need to be adjusted to get your basic tune which we do in an off-the-shelf map a lot of the ECU's attention is also spent on protecting components such as pistons, rods, the engine block, clutches, drive shafts, diffs, from the effects of torque, pressure, force, temperature, knock. They're also aiming for smoothness and sportiness. There's a lot of things that have careful gradients so no sudden steps happen. Even on an RS motor, there's a lot going on at part throttle to smooth out the torque delivery and make this a car that you can use daily. And it's a lot smoother, for example, with all those strategies than, say, a 1990s Subaru or Evo wire with a cable throttle. Also, there are priorities over all of this from the manufacturer's point of view for emissions and economy. So in terms of delivering torque, it's delivered as a result of combustion, which is due to air, fuel and spark. And there are a couple of ways that the ECU can adjust this. It can adjust it very quickly in a hundredth of a second with ignition timing. It can also cut fuel for the next cylinder event. More slowly, but necessary for a more prolonged torque, you adjust the throttle position and the boost. Sometimes the throttle position is used for traction control, but some interventions such as a really quick gear shift might need a really quick retard of ignition just for milliseconds to cut the torque. It's important to remember that the pedal is only one request into the whole torque structure and the basic idea of it is, is that it takes your pedal position and the engine speed 
and you then set a torque that you want at that pedal position and engine speed. Load is a concept that goes with torque and boost in between really, where it is an estimate, not a measurement of the trapped fresh air in the cylinder based around 100% being normally aspirated. So if you have a 2.5 litre engine that's normally aspirated and is 100% efficient, then that would have a load of 100. If you've got enough boost going in it to double that to make it like a 5 litre engine, then you've got 200% load. There isn't a mass airflow sensor on these engines, so instead there's a complex model that's used based on the amount of residual gas that's left in the cylinders, dirty air if you like, that can't be burnt on the next combustion because you don't usually get 100% efficiency and certainly not when using turbos. And a rough estimate that's supplied for a couple of decades on most VAG motors using Bosch or other ECUs is that the engine load can be estimated to be roughly 30 lower than the boost in kilopascals. So for example, if you have 1.3 bar of boost, which is 230 kilopascals absolute, you might have a 200% load there. In your logs, you can see what the load is, what the boost is, what the torque is. So you'll get used to converting between torque, load and boost. The aim is to have the throttle open early for efficiency and in performance terms on this particular ECU we want the throttle to be open all the time unless there's a traction control intervention gear shift or overboost or a fault. So torque, load and boost are all converted between each other and the lowest limit is them usually wins. And the aim is to get the highest efficiency except for periods where you don't like a idle control to smooth it out, or a traction control intervention, or a gear shift. We preserve in our off-the-shelf maps the factory smoothness that you get at part throttle because we keep the relationship between torque and load like it is at the factory, and this is important because of the modules like the transmission control and the ESP. They communicate in torque in newton meters, and if we end up misscaling these things, we can end up with roughness in driving, fault codes, slipping clutches and so on. So that's an important thing to get right on anything that has other modules that want to communicate with the ECU by means of torque. You can occasionally break these rules at very high torque levels if you've got some limit that you can't get around. On DAS are a particularly important feature that everybody's concerned with on the stock engine are the rods and I believe these are from Audi Sport or another forum and some lovely Carrillo rods there and what I believe to be a stock as a rod and a bent one of the same. You can look at the rod and say that it doesn't look very good. You can do metallurgical studies, send it away, measure hardness or you can go off the people that have been before you unfortunately have bent some rods on DAZA because it's such a tunable engine it seems to reach the limits of its rods quite easily if you're not perhaps uh, rather careful. The experience of this varies very much. Um, some people bend rods at surprisingly low boost and some at high boost and boost is certainly not the only factor nor probably is the actual torque as we'll move on to. A lot of people on this platform are talking of 100 to 110 pound foot per cylinder. And so you could multiply that by 1.36 to get Newton meters and then stick that in as a torque target or limit. And that can work for stage one tune. We don't do it that way because it isn't really very extensible. And once you start modifying the engine beyond stage one, the torque values are no longer accurate. And whose dyno are we basing them on anyway when dynos can easily vary 20% between each other in day to day? Torque, which is brake mean effective pressure, does that really determine when the rods will bend? Or are we more worried about the peak cylinder pressure? The reason I bring this up is that it's well known for a long time that there is one free lunch that you get with turbocharging, which is that when you cram more air into the cylinder, 
as long as you get the ignition timing correct, you can, for example, double the torque of an engine, but only increase the peak cylinder pressure by 10 to 20 percent. And this is because the area under the curve as the piston is forced down by the combustion is much larger, but the peak is not much higher. So we can use this to our advantage, and that's why, for example, if you turbocharge a normally aspirated engine, you may double its torque, but you don't double the peak cylinder pressure. Um, that, that's really quite good news for turbocharging. But of course, there comes a point where if you keep increasing the average cylinder pressure, eventually your peak will go up. The peak cylinder pressure is often determined by ignition timing, flame speed. It can also go up quite high with engine knock, which is something that should be strongly avoided when you raise the torque. It should be particularly avoided when tuning with ethanol, because if you're knocking on ethanol, then um, things are not going great. A gear shift with poorly controlled boost which we often see on VAG motors when people tune them without good logging or boost control strategies, could also give quite a spike at the wrong point, and that can bend a rod. Also, wheel slip and then grip can cause quite astounding changes in, in cylinder pressure. You can even see it on some of the boost curves where the boost can go quite out of control with wheel slip, so that needs to be borne in mind. Pre-ignition is a nasty thing, which can punch a hole straight in the top of a piston under the spark plug, or it can bend a rod, or just break a rod, uh, and it's catastrophic. It's avoidable with correct tuning and parts, generally. Pre-ignition is often caused by excessively high temperatures. It can be caused by knock as well, by running lean. Lean isn't mean. Generally, you get a fairly flat increase, flat level of power over quite a wide range of air to fuel ratio. And if you try and run too lean, you just tend to melt things when people get into top speed or half mile runs. So don't try and go too lean, especially on alcohols. <coughs> so the plan regarding rods for most tuners is to obtain strong torque with a high average bit of controlled peak cylinder pressure. They can do that by having a reasonable amount of boost, but being careful with the mid-range ignition timing. They may have their own strategies regarding valve timing as well, which can mitigate the peak cylinder pressure. A lot of people on OEM rods on many platforms try similar tricks. They'll hold back the boost for a little while and then let it rip, so over four and a half, five thousand 5,000 RPM. And this, this can help if you've got a good transmission and a keen driver that wants to keep it between five and seven or eight thousand revs, then you're really past peak torque on stock turbos. And these are big turbos can also help because you push the torque up higher and you fill in the normal drop that you would get at the top, but without conspicuously higher peak loads on the engine, although you still have to be careful because if you want to run 600 pound foot at 7,000 RPM, you're going to make a lot of power, of course, but it's still 600 pound foot through five rather slender looking rods. So finally, we're at a point having discussed torque and load that we want to reach a boost target. And we really leave this in our off the shelf maps based on one final table. We're quite happy for tuning to use boost as a target for what we want to do. We're not particularly bothered about running a target load or a target torque. The reason for this is that we want to make good use of the turbo in all conditions, at all temperatures and all atmospheric pressures. And if we choose a sensible boost level, that in itself will cap the torque if you also use sensible ignition timing. The turbo is a multiplier of the air pressure that comes into its inducer. So that's atmospheric pressure minus any losses in the intake. The losses in the intake can be in the order of 5, 10, 15% depending on the intake design. We actually usually zero these losses so that 
when we make a target boost, we have a single table that has a single target for that RPM. And that sets what your full pedal boost is going to be. So it's pretty easy. I'll show you that table now. Because we use flex fuel and map switching, we make new copies of relevant tables like this because they are blended by ethanol content and they're also switchable as well. So in this case, let's look at ethanol boost. The x-axis here is atmospheric pressure in hectopascals and standard atmospheric pressure is 1013. So at sea level, you'll be running down the right hand side of this. And you can see in fact that we've put the values all the same. So even at just over half normal atmospheric pressure, which is unfeasibly low, the turbo will still be trying to compress that lower atmospheric pressure by 2.75 times up to 5,000 revs, and then it will taper off so that it's trying to achieve 2.5 times at 7,000 revs. So if, for example, you do have exactly 1,000 hectopascals atmospheric pressure, you need to sea level in fairly normal weather, then your absolute boost pressure target will be 2.75 times atmosphere, dropping to 2.5 times atmosphere, unless there is some fault, some traction control event, some other limit, excessive knock, excessive temperature. But this is basically your boost target. So this really isn't any, diff any more difficult to the old fashioned uh, electronic boost controllers, except it's backed up by all the integration with ECU and all the, the safeties involved. It's a multiplier, so it doesn't have units, but the ECU does work in metric units for pressure. So a thousand hectopascals or a hundred kilopascals is roughly one atmosphere. And fortunately or unfortunately, metric does make that a lot easier to understand. But if you take this number here at 7,000 RPM, that's 2.5. If you knock off of one to get your relative boost pressure, that's 1.5. So 1.5 bar, 22 PSI roughly at the top. 1.75 bar, that's roughly 26 PSI at normal atmospheric pressure. So here we set in 26 PSI going down to 22. If you want more in the mid range, you can have it set it higher here. We'll talk in a future video about how this is actually delivered and the shape of the wastegate duty curve and how much is left on the table of these off the shelf maps and various strategies that can be used for bigger turbos. I hope this has been useful. We'll follow it up with other videos. Tell us in the comments and discussion what you would like to see. Thank you.